Here we go, we're here. Hello, I'm Tara Bravazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 177. Authorship. Just about every second email or message I receive on Facebook or Twitter is about authorship. This is a weeping wound in international higher education and we're going to talk about it today. One of the great problems that exists in the discussion of authorship is the culture of secrecy that enfolds it. I recently ran a training session for supervisors and two wonderful young men, uh, very junior lecturers, but they were coming to all the training that I offered. And at the end of this particular session, I said, you know, guys, thank you so much for being here and giving me your time. You seem to be coming to every single session I run. And these guys were quite remarkable. They said, no, uh, we are thrilled to be here because, and I won't name the institution where they did their PhD, but they said, my supervisor ripped us off and we want to make sure that this culture, this cycle of abuse stops with us. We want to be a different type of academic. How incredibly inspirational is that? But we all know, don't we, there are whispers in corridors about authorship, conversations in the tea room, hushed tones, and whispers and gossip through conference morning teas. We know that. The abuse will continue while the silence continues. So today, the silence is going to stop. And I'm going to start with three stories of authorship from me. They are my stories to tell, and I'll tell you why. All those messages and emails that I receive, the student starts with, hello, this is who I am. I just want to talk to you about something, but please don't use my name, don't share this, keep this matter confidential, because I'm frightened what my advisor or my supervisor might do. So you can see the fear that exists in these types of conversations. So I am going to tell three stories and then mine to tell. But then after those stories of authorship, I'm going to move to the policy environment. I'm going to talk about the policy, the wonderful policy that is now in place in Australia, which is clear and really precise. I'll also internationalise it with the discussion of the Vancouver Protocol as well. But I also then want to finish up with some strategies for authorship, how to manage behaviour and to create a different type of practice for research. But let's start with my stories of authorship. Now, I am, a, I suppose, a pretty unusual academic in that 70% 70, 70 of my books and articles are singly authored. Okay, so most of the time I don't have to deal with co-authors. And so therefore that makes the three stories that I'm about to tell you even more horr horrifying because obviously working with co-authors is a bit of a minority area of my career. So if these horror stories are happening to me when only 30% of my publications involve co-authors, what's happening in the disciplines and the fields where co-authorship is the norm, is standard. And also I'm staunch. I'm really staunch about authorship and I'm really staunch for my students' authorship and my colleagues as well. But let's do these three stories and speak about the culture of abuse that exists. And of course, my first story starts with my PhD. Same as you guys. So I'm a young woman. I have an older male supervisor. Now, differently, I suppose, from a lot of you, I didn't just come from honours. I'd done a research master's first. And before I came to the PhD, I had five refereed articles and one book chapter. So six refereed publications, of which four were singly authored and two were written with another PhD student. So I knew something of authorship and writing and publishing. I've been pretty successful publishing at a very young age. So I came into the PhD knowing some stuff. But when I arrived in this gentleman's office to start the PhD supervision, he told me that he wanted co-authorship of all the articles I would write during the PhD. In fact, he stated, when a student is supervised by a supervisor, the supervisor gets co-authorship. As clear as that. Now this was a long time ago, 
I am close to death. That was a long time ago, but it didn't seem right to me at the time. And that's because it wasn't right. He didn't read a word of my thesis. He didn't develop the topic. He didn't develop the research questions. I came to the PhD with a fully fleshed project before I even met him. So I laughed at him. <laughs> and I said no. And nine refereed articles came from that PhD with about six other articles emerging from research that sprung from the PhD, if you will. And all of those were solely authored because I reaped them. But there were consequences for my decision. He didn't read a word of the thesis and when the time came to submit that PhD, he wouldn't sign it off because you've guessed it, he hadn't read it. He then proceeded though, and this is the important bit of the story I think, whenever he was given an opportunity for the rest of his career to badmouth me, he would do so. So there was a consequence for my decision and my behaviour. Interesting enough, when I became better known, he called in, tried to call in some favours from me at certain points. And I told him to jump in the lake. All words to that effect. Okay, but the first point of this story is as follows. A supervisor assumes simply by being a supervisor that authorship would be part of the deal. It is not part of the deal, I refused but then you'll notice that supervisor behaved badly for decades after in response. Okay, story one. Story two, it gets worse. I'm a full professor, and after I was a full professor, I enrolled in a research master's in education. Now I'm aware that's quite an unusual combination in and of itself, but obviously very experienced researcher, professor, so when the time came to write the master's uh, dissertation of 50,000 words, I basically just wrote it and uh, the day before I was going to submit it, because I didn't need a supervisor obviously, the day before I submitted it as a courtesy, I sent an email to my supervisor and said, hi, look, I know you haven't heard from me, I'm submitting this thesis tomorrow and, uh, and cheers and just letting you know as a courtesy that it's going in tomorrow. So as you can see, the supervisor had no role because I had no contact with them and then I submitted. And she said in response to that email, I need to be a co-author of anything that you publish from that thesis. Now I laughed, I laughed a lot. I really, really, I thought she was joking. When it became very clear that she wasn't actually joking, I immediately contacted the dean and said, just to be clear, this person has had no role in these publications and they are not getting co-authorship, full stop. There was some interesting, uncomfortable conversations and so forth, but it was so clear that the person had no dealings with the article that the Dean agreed there would be no co-authorship. She didn't contribute anything, why would she gain authorship? Now, this was important and it was a professor, I knew it was important because this dissertation went on to be the University of Google, the book that really is my claim to fame, really. My career changed through this book. And when I die, there is no doubt the first line of my obituary will be Tara Brabazon, comma, author of the University of Google. So I was aware in real time that this was a valuable book, valuable book intellectually, valuable book financially, team, valuable book authorship matters. Okay, so I won. I claimed my authorship as was my right. But the story doesn't end there and this is where the dark truth I'm sharing with you today is going to turn a bit bent and twisted. So if you were going to be staunch on your authorship and you make people uncomfortable, they will lash out. So yes, I submitted that thesis and that university at that time had a system whereby there was an internal examiner within the institution and an external examiner. So after the examination was completed, the external examiner sent me an email and told me it was the greatest piece of work he'd ever read. What he didn't know, and I only found out later, was that he granted that master's a first class honours. They gave it a, an honours ranking, so he granted a first class honours. The internal examiner granted it a third. 
The entire examination process took 18 months because the internal examiner, they had an arbitration protocol in place in that particular university. So the internal examiner tried to convince the external examiner that actually it was a poor thesis. Thankfully, the external examiner was a very, very senior man, knew his stuff, very famous, tremendous, and he held firm. And he also let me know what was going on through the process. So what actually ended up happening, because the external examiner was that staunch, is they ended up pointing, appointing a second external examiner who granted it a first class honours grading. And I ended up with the Dean's Award for the best thesis. So this is what happens when you rock the boat. You embarrass people about authorship, you confront them with difficult truths, the system does bite back. And remember, I was a full professor in a university when this stuff was going on. So yes, I seem very staunch and I fight for my authorship rights, and yes I do, but my final story that I'm gonna share with you today shows you that yes, even with my staunch stance, I did crumble. Okay, I was a full professor again in the British RAE system, so the research assessment exercise. And I was in the first six months, so my probation period of this chair. In the RAE, the best four articles are summoned and entered by an individual during a particular period. So I had about 52 publications during that period, so I was picking the best four. My best four ended up being two singly authored books two singly authored books and two singly authored refereed articles. So I had a choice and I could really pick the cream of some pretty good publications. But, so it was all going well, but during the six months period, I was brought into a pro vice chancellor's office and he said to me that he needed a fourth article for the RAE. He said he didn't have time to write it and was this avert, I don't have time to write it you'll have to write it and add my name to it. His other three articles, he only had three in the period, that's what was causing the problem. His other three articles, he was the third author on, the last author, and he wasn't from a lab environment. So you get the picture. But the conversation was very complicated. He was averting in the authorship, but the issues about my probation concluding were raised in the same conversation. Nothing is averted, if you don't write this you don't get probation, but there was this intimation that was really uncomfortable. And I needed that job, I wanted that job. So I worked 20 hour days for seven days and wrote that article. I presented it to him, and you'll love this bit, I presented it to him and he said, I don't know if I agree with it. And I said, that's not a worry, I wrote it anyway, I'll just get it published with my name, not a worry. Uh, needless to say, he then said, no, 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 my name is going on it. He was so desperate to enter the RAE that he added his name to a piece he didn't even like. And, it embarrasses me to say this, he gained first authorship on that piece, where he didn't write a word, didn't conduct any research, didn't inflect or inform the interpretation. So, this is about power. This is about power. Me as a full professor having to manage the demands of a PVC because I was during my probation. So you can see why I care so desperately about authorship, about power and PhD students. This is a big deal. I take this personally and therefore it is time that this secrecy stops. Let's move now beyond my experience or the experience that we all go into and through and let's now look at policy and the new governance that exists in this area to frame and shape these debates. So authorship now is part of a suite of new policies coming from the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research. Wow, this is fantastic. So we are now in a highly regulated space. All disciplines are covered, no exception. So whenever anyone says, oh look in my discipline, no, 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 no. All disciplines, all subjects, everything covered. Top-down governance, thanks for playing. So in the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research, principle four is the most important, quote, fairness in the treatment of others. 
end of quote, and researchers must, quote, give credit, including authorship, where appropriate to those who have contributed to the research, end of quote. So you'll notice the phrase, where appropriate, let's dig into the policy, when is it appropriate? Well, the authorship criteria is an individual who has made a significant intellectual or scholarly contribution to the research and the output and has agreed to be listed as an author. So what we learned so far is consent is required for authorship. So you can't simply be added to a publication. You must consent and then this, the intellectual contribution that you make must be significant. Now you're thinking, oh God, what does significant mean? Well, quite wonderfully, the code defines significant contribution with great clarity. Oh, how I love this. So let's get into it. What is significant? Boom, boom, so excited. So authorship should include two of, or more of the following characteristics. Let's get into it. This is the code. Conception or design of the project or output, so design of the research. Acquisition of data, where the acquisition required judgment, planning, design and input. So for our science colleagues, running samples is not sufficient. Three, contribution to knowledge, and this is the crucial bit, including indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge systems, incredibly important to the new code, so this is terrific. Then we've got analysis or interpretation of the research data, and then, and I love this bit, drafting significant parts of the research output, critically revising it to contribute to the interpretation. So putting a spelling check through it, giving it a bit of a draft, that's not enough. You have to critically revise it to contribute to the interpretation. Fantastic. So this code is also clear that authorship must not be given if an individual has not made that intellectual contribution. So authorship should not be given, and the code goes into when do you not give authorship, this is brilliant, uh, for the provision of funding. So if you just get some dough in, that's great, you've got dough in, has nothing to do with authorship, or data or materials or infrastructure. If you provide an infrastructure, that's great, that's not authorship. Also provision of technical support, that's not authorship. The position of the individual, like, being a supervisor or a head of department. It actually says this in the code. Just because you're a supervisor, just because you're a head of department or a head of school, that doesn't mean you're an author. That's called gift authorship, by the way. And gift authors authorship is specifically named and shamed in the code as bad practice. So breaches to the code include failing to give authorship to people who merit it within these requirements or attributing authorship without consent. So as you can see, this is really, really clear. The idea that so much nastiness and nonsense and conflict emerges is extraordinary when right now everything is really, really clear. But what Australian universities recommend, and I really back this, and this is why this, this vlog really matters, I think, so much, is you need to create and develop and hold and maintain evidence that you are an author. So put everything in writing, your role in the research, and try and work out as early as you can the order for the authors of the research. And remember, you're going to have to justify the ordering of the authors of that research. So think about it this way. You know, start as you mean to continue. Think about it this way. Say you're writing this article with some people and that's great, but say there's a dispute and someone like me asks you, what evidence have you got to confirm your authorship? So right from the start, develop that evidential base and ensure that you could make the case if you are required to. So what evidence have you got? Save every version, every iteration of your piece. Date it, have the track changes, save the track changes lab books, really do care about the digital iterations. Make sure you've preserved those. I didn't in the old days, guys, either. Old days, many, even six months ago. So I would just embed the, the track changes and move on. Now I save every version of every draft. And also email correspondence. Hold on to it. 
Remember, for every single research output, think about how you would prove your authorship and you have to demonstrate how you are an author. So just going, oh look, I'm an author, or go, oh look, I've been ripped off. Actually, none of that matters, to be frank with you. You've got to create evidence to prove it. And I think the University of Western Australia, respect to my wonderful colleagues at UWA, UWA has, I think, the best procedure to manage authorship at the moment. I'm very impressed. They have a statement of authorship form and wants to ensure that these decisions are logged through this form and the decisions are made early and the form is endlessly updated as the authorship and the research changes. So this is, this is great stuff. This is great. Okay, so let me now show you some examples of how authorship can exist. So how you today, when you're doing co-authorship, can start to log this work. Okay, and I'm going to give you two examples of two pieces that I was brought in as the third author. Okay, so one was in medicine, one was in education, so two very different fields. But so I'm third author, so I'm the, the trailing author, if you will, the one that's contributed really the least. So let me show you how I've proved I reached that threshold. And they're interesting cases, these two, because I was brought in after a substantive piece was already in place. So therefore, how did I make a contribution and how did I prove I'd made a contribution through authorship? So one piece, wonderful piece, was exploring first year medical curriculum. So deal, dealing with a medical degree and how information literacy, particularly medical information literacy, is taught to students in first year. It's a really great project. And the two writers of that piece didn't have that deep expertise in information literacy and developing the information scaffold and curricular design. And what happened was these two authors were heavily quoting the University of Google and they said to me look it's got to a point now where I think we're almost oversighting it and I'm worried would you like to come in to this piece and write a fresh section on information literacy and first year medical education okay so I said well look let, let's have a go so I did that I wrote the section of the article so I wrote this this block of this piece I wrote the introductory work into that section and the outro of that section I drafted and edited the entire piece so it hung together quite well so by the criteria of authorship at the time and indeed now I got to the threshold and I was listed as the third author and great partnerships and further pieces have come from that wonderful collaboration. So great stuff, I reached the threshold. So you can write a section like that, as long as you're drafting and agree with the lot, thanks for playing. The other example is a recent one on Harry Potter and education, this was only published I think three weeks ago, and what had happened was this piece on Harry Potter and education had moved through journals but unsuccessfully, so it hadn't quite got through refereeing. And the two researchers, again, who I'd never met and knew my work through Twitter, approached me to see if I could help through a collaboration. So bring me into the piece and see if we can improve it and lift it. So, look, I, I opened the document. I looked at the document. I was happening to be flying back uh, from Vancouver to Sydney and then to Adelaide. So I had a really long 13-hour flight. I thought, you know what, I could watch some films. How about I have a go with this? So I wanted to see what I could do. So I opened the file, put on tracked changes, and for my own sense of self, see if I could get to the threshold of authorship with complete transparency and accountability for our two colleagues. So also through track changes, there was a full record of my work and colleagues could simply ignore the track changes and go back to their version if they didn't like it. Okay, so what I did for this piece was I wrote a brand new abstract, I wrote a new introduction, I wrote a new conclusion. Then I offered a detailed theorization of neoliberalism. I have about 850 pages of notes on neoliberalism, so I was able to swing in some really edgy, interesting neoliberal theories, which the piece was lacking, so it had that theoretical height and energy, that's great. I then also deleted their work on pretty tired representational theory, because it's a bit tired, a bit old now, so I deleted that and brought in instead the andragogical potential of popular culture, that is how popular culture teaches us about education and schools and teaching and learning. Okay, so I worked through the entire trip and by the conclusion of the piece I looked at it and thought, look, I've 
contributed a fair amount there. I'm comfortable to send this on to colleagues and let them make a determination. So I submitted it to the other authors. They were incredibly happy. They accepted the track changes. It was put into a journal and accepted. And actually, I ended up being the second author on the piece. That stuff doesn't worry me at all. My priority was to do the right thing and just get to the threshold for colleagues so it's fair for them. So as you can see through those two examples, I offered a clear contribution which I tracked, which I demonstrated and left the other authors with the opportunity to remove me easily through digitisation. Okay, so I was conscious of the importance of you know, stepping up to the plate if you're the third author, because I've had some bad experiences with this. So I once wrote a book with two other people. One of the authors contributed only a thousand words, and they were really bad thousand words. So the other author was pretty cross at me, the second author, because we'd worked pretty hard on it. So I ended up basically deleting those thousand words, took the vibe from the piece, the kernel of the idea, and I wrote around it. And that person was still listed as an author, okay? Similarly, there's another case of a third author. They contributed much less than the other two authors. And through the refereeing process, the chapter that they actually wrote, <coughs> apologies, guys, I'm just, just managing a cold at the moment, so we're doing well. But through the refereeing of that chapter that they wrote, uh, it was that, that chapter was discredited through the refereeing. So they said, look, great book, that chapter's a problem. So I had to basically hollow out that chapter and rewrite it. Now, I still gave that person authorship, third authorship, yeah. It was the right thing to do. I always try and do the right thing. But by the code, those two cases, probably they could have been acknowledged rather than authorship. But I tend to probably be over generous because I don't want to rip people off. Okay, so remember when you are claiming authorship, particularly as a student, and you know, I know you all do, they're the emails I get, you know, this person has ripped me off, that's fine. But always remember, particularly I think in the humanities and the social sciences, that when you're saying, look, I've done this, just a reminder that maybe your work has been edited or changed through refereeing. So you need to be informed of this, you need to go through all the refereeing processes as I do right now, explain to the student this is how this material is moving. And when you're going, I've done this, some of your material may not have survived through the drafting process. So always be aware of that. So now, today, post the code, which arrived in July this year, 2019, I've come up with solutions to manage the, this type of ambiguity. And these two solutions may provide a way forward for you today and thinking about your own authorship in the years to come. So how I handle authorship now, I'm going to provide an example in a book and in an article. So I'm writing a book at the moment with Dr. Tiffany Knight, hello wonderful Tiff, who you've met in the vlog series, and our Head of Examinations, the wonderful Natalie Hills. So we're writing a book together, we've nearly finished it actually, it should be out in the next three or four months, but we've each written sections, chapters of it, in fact really I've written basically the first third, then Tiff then our Natalie. So what's happened is in those chapters, we've listed the chapter title, but then the author, the substantive author. So I've knitted all the sections together. We've all drafted it and edited it, so we agree with what we're saying as a family. But the authorship is really clear in this book, specified in the section. So that's a way, if you've got a book, and you want to make sure everybody's getting credit correctly, that's one way to do it, and it's worked really well. So let me tell you how I'm handling it with a refereed article with my wonderful student, Tanya Hall. Hi, Tan, you're a legend. So Tanya, again, had written a piece on the NDIS and social workers, and I drafted it as a supervisor, and there'd been some challenges getting it through refereeing. So she asked if I would co-author it with her. So once more, I've switched on track changes. I'm doing it right now, by the way, as I'm doing this vlog. So I've then track changed. I've added, I had about 40 articles from 2018 and 19 that I've started adding to this piece. And then what happens is once a week, I share my work with Tan. All track changes. So she can see it, decide if she likes it or not, remove the corrections, or embed them. So that's fully transparent for Tanya. And again, we don't know where that's going to go. Right at the end, she might just say, oh, look, no, I want to go on my own. And then it's hers to unravel all my work and go forward from there. Okay, so digitization is great. It helps us with that document management and enables us to really itemize the research and the drafting. So it's excellent. Do use it. There is now no excuse for courtesy authorship ever. There is no excuse for the phrase, oh look, this is the way it's done in our discipline. 
like nah. Australia has great policies and they're incredibly robust and we'll be talking about the Vancouver Protocol in a second. So therefore it's now time to change the culture. This matters to you, it matters to me, it matters to the nation, it matters to knowledge. It's also important that we really clearly recognise the difference between supervising a PhD and gaining authorship on an article or book. They can be linked and you know, often are, but the case must be made, not assumed. I know bad stuff happens in the authorship space. Each discipline does have its own customs and its own practices and that's great. But we need to recognise now that authorship is regulated, top down nationally. If authorship is mishandled, then researchers are opening themselves up to claims of unethical conduct. And look, this is not unusual, team. It's, it's hard to get data and research on the scale of research misconduct, but there was an article by Whistler, W-I-S-L-A-R, Whistler et al. in 2011, 2011, so a little while ago now. But this was a study of six prestigious medical journals. And they found in their study that one in four articles includes an unjustified author. One in four has that courtesy authorship, someone that shouldn't be there is there, one in four. And one in 10 articles did not include an author that should have been included, one in 10. Authorship matters because it holds a scholarly importance but also social and financial power. It is tethered to responsibility and accountability. And increasingly journals, and I love this, increasingly journals are wanting detailed and clear publishing information about the contribution of every single person listed in that article. And I am completely in favour of that. That is excellent. I want all parties to sign a percentage. I know it's all arbitrary, but still sign a percentage. Research design, what have you done? Who did what? Interpretation of that data set, writing and editing. Tell me about who's done what, love that. So authorship must be discussed before an article is published. But actually I would, right at the start of the research, I'd talk about authorship. And you know, I always say to our wonderful PhD students, right at the start, before you even think I'm gonna have this person as a supervisor, first conversation is how are we gonna manage authorship? Let's talk about it. So students know a supervisor or an advisor's expectation. And they therefore, if they're unhappy with the supervisor's advisor's expectations, they can approach another supervisor right at the start. So I want to finish off by internationalising this. We've got wonderful international viewers of this vlog. Hi guys. And a lot of our students in Australia will end up working around the world. And so therefore I just want to internationalise it by talking about the Vancouver Protocol, the VP. This commenced with a group of editors of medical journals in Vancouver um, in 1978. And they became the International Committee of Medical Journal editors, okay? So authorship in the Vancouver Protocol is determined for sufficient public accountability to take that public accountability for the content. So you know enough of what's going on here that if that research is questioned in any form, you take public responsibility for what's in that piece, right? So it requires, and you'll notice the similarity to the Australian Code, substantial contribution to design and conception, analysis, interpretation of data, drafting the article, and I love this, revising it critically for intellectual content. So it's not just giving it a draft, putting a spelling checker through it, revising it for intellectual content, lovely, and final approval of the published version. So if contributors don't meet this criteria, then they simply should not be listed as authors. They can have seen to have some contribution in the acknowledgements. Most journals now have that very nice acknowledgement component where if someone's done something to help the piece, they can go in there rather than authors. So the VP recommends that footnotes be included to explain the ordering of the authors. Now again, I love that. So this is the way they've been listed. Why? Explain it to me. Vancouver Protocol, rock and roll. So as you can see, this is just not simply humanities versus science. That's actually not about the story at all. 
For example, mathematics in particular uses the Hardy Littlewood rule, which I really love. I mean, maths, much respect to all our wonderful maths guys. You are the wizards of our university, our maths colleagues. But those guys in those pieces, of course, list the authors alphabetically. Classic maths, good idea. And all are equal rather than first author dominating. Look, probably that's going to have to change too. So yes, lift them out, list them alphabetically. That's what happens in the discipline. But there's going to probably have to be more data there about explaining what each person has done. So the challenge we have in higher degrees, in PhDs and research masters, is that the leader of the project often determines the order of the authors. So that means younger researchers, early career researchers, PhD students tend to be disempowered in this environment. So let me finish with one final story today. And this happened within the first year of my arrival at Flinders. A great student, wonderful student of mine, Glory, had just submitted her PhD. It was under examination and she was sitting right there and we're going, this is great. And she said to me, what's next? And I said, well, this is clearly a book, Glory. This is the easiest book you'll ever see. Just do a find, replace, find PhD, replace with book, thanks for playing, straight through. And Glory said to me, do you want to co-author it with me? And I said to Glory, got quite emotional as I am now, I said to Glory, it's your work. I'll help you with anything, I'll give it a draft. Again, I'll help you with the book proposal, but it's your work. And then I took a breath and I leaned forward and I said to Glory, Never, ever do that again. Never rely on the goodwill of somebody to say, no, I don't want authorship. Never give somebody that chance. It's your work. It is your work. And I, I think writing the forward of the piece, and that was great. So we all as supervisors, you as students, all of us have to respect the rights and the responsibilities of our students. We write, the whole point about why we write, why this matters, why it matters so much. We write to connect our research with the past, the colleagues that have brought us here, and to arch forward to the future of research. That's why we do what we do. Research can and must create profound intellectual generosity, but I know it also summons jealousy and cruelty and abuse, and indeed theft. But the culture is changing. We are now in a highly regulated and governed environment. We must change. Business as usual, this is how it's always been done in the discipline. That stuff's gone. It's gone. We need to now create the change. And indeed, we need to be the change that we want to see. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia. <laughs>